Okay, let's write a show. Oh, yes. Uh, what we should write about? I know, a show about Greek mythology. Oh, that could be fun. There are so many good myths we could represent. No, I think it would be better if it seems like it was written by someone who many years ago heard a few myths and remembers them very badly, but with very obscure and correct references. Okay, I guess that could work. Should we leave something from the original myths apart from those tiny details? Uh, yes, of course. We should keep the misogyny. What? I don't think modern audiences would like that at all, especially if we're not to follow the real myths. Then I don't know, put a woman who fights, people think that's feminist, but I want characters to rape women and be the good guys. But... but... I want characters to rape women and be the good guys. Hello my beautiful basilisks and mythology in mind, you can call me Eminem, and today we'll be reviewing the second episode of Blood of Zeus, Pastis Prologue. I commented and corrected the first one, A Call to the Arms, last time, so go check out that out first. I mean, if you want, because it's not that difficult to follow this series. So let's get into it. And again, obviously, spoiler alert. We start with what is supposed to be Corinth. I don't see the resembles, but maybe you do. Then we see a pregnant woman, Heron's mother, saying that is too soon. They sit her on a chair so she can give birth. I know this seems weird to us modern audiences, but this is factually correct. Maybe the chair is not that accurate, as those used to look like this, but not that bad. One of the ladies helping her goes away, and when Heron's mother asks why, they told her that they are calling the king. She says that the king is going to kill her child and asks the remaining one to keep her promise. This is mentioned a few times, so I guess it will come up later, but not for this episode, so we will forget about that. Well, she has the quickest birth in history, even though a full birth is usually between 12 and 24 hours, especially for first-time mothers, which I suppose it is. I mean, she takes 5 seconds to birth a child when it's crowning, which takes between 20 minutes and 2 hours. I know they're not going to show the full process, but you know, they could manage the sensation that time has passed. Anyway, the baby looks like the typical representation of an ancient Egyptian kid. The king enters with a handful of soldiers and he takes the baby away from the mother. He forces one of the baby's eyes open and when he sees that he's brown, he chills and he accepts the child. As he does this, she births another baby in like three pushes. Um, the midwife says that there are two placentas and that that means that there are two fathers. I don't know if Asian Greek people thought that, but it could be. I mean, they believe that if you sneeze after sex while squatting, you couldn't get pregnant, so anything is possible. The king takes the second child and he opens one of his eyes and they are blue. The king says that she has been unfaithful and he takes a knife and he's going to stop the baby. But a golden eagle flies inside the room and it saves the baby. Edon wakes up. Well, I don't know if he was sleeping or having a vision, but it came in the worst moment and he's currently hanging off a cliff. He goes to the top and he checks the wounds in his feet, which are definitely not near enough for having climbed the mountain without shoes. The top of the mountain is conveniently flat AF and Aaron finds the weird roses in no time. The roses are blue, which I love, but blue roses don't exist in nature, so if I were him, I would take that bush, plant it in my house, sell those flowers and get rich. But he just starts chipping stone from a rock nearby, even though he was told the metal was underneath the bush. A few hours later, he arrives at his house and the old man is preparing a fort. So, they are poor, but they have their own fort? Okay, maybe it is for baking bread, but it doubles as a fort, who knows. As the old man starts to melt the rocks, Heron draws a syllable in the sand and asks him if he knows what that means. The old dude says that that's Corinth's emblem. It isn't, but it's true that Corinth used a Pegasus as a symbol for coins and stuff. Eron tells him that he has seen that symbol in a dream, and the old man tells him that dreams can be deceiving. He takes an amphor that was lying around there casually, like in the first episode, but is also exquisitely painted, so that would be very expensive. So my point stands about them not being that poor. And the amphor has just the perfect image to cover the topic of discussion, of which Eron, the amphor's owner, doesn't know about. Okay. In the Amphor, three of the Oniros appear. The Oniros were the thousand personifications of dreams, but they only talk about three. I mean, those are the three most important ones, but they won't even mention the other 997. 
wrote, It is true that these three only appeared in God's and King's dreams, so maybe that's why. The graphic representation is not good also, as they were supposed to be beautiful young men with dark wings. Anyway, they talk about Fobetor, whose name would create the term phobia, but the gods call him Mikelo, maybe because they don't have phobias? I guess they have a lot of time to work on them, so maybe that's it. The series tell us that he caused nightmares. What they don't mention is that he could also cause prophetic dreams, and he appeared in dreams in the shape of animals or beasts. Fantaso, the second one, is said to cause illusions and be deceiving, but by the series. I mean he could be, but as his brother, he could also give prophetic dreams. He was the representation of surreal dreams, and he was the plants and inanimate objects in those. The world fantasy comes from his name. Lastly, and most famous of them all, we have Morpheus. No, I'm sorry, I won't put Morpheus from Matrix here, that joke is too predictable, even for me. The series tells us that he gives visions of truth, and I have to resist the blue pill, red pill references. <sighs> okay, I'm good. I mean, he can. He gives pleasant dreams in general, and he takes human shape in those dreams. I know they all look scary, but believe me, Greek people picture them in a way that was way more pleasant to look at. We are told that these brothers are always trying to outdo each other, whatever that means. The intro comes in, and it's pretty simple but nice, blue roses growing to form the title of the series. Then we see Alexa, but she won't appear for a long time after this, so forget about her. Well, at least our soldiers have shields in this episode, and that's a relief, for me. The image then cuts to Eron, who is carrying the most absurdly giant rock so we can see how strong and how much of a demigod he is. Good job, Eron. I don't get what is the purpose of that rock, but nice arms, though. The people in the police are preparing themselves to fight, and Eron thinks they're crazy for staying. Thank you for having some self-conservation instinct, Eron. You haven't disappointed me as a protagonist yet, and that's weird. Keep it up. Eron goes to seek his mother, who is in their vegetable patch, and he tells her that he has had a dream where his mother was a queen. She tells him that she was married to a king long ago. A bisexual king, I hope. This is a Greek series after all, so give me the gay. But now seriously, if they don't have at least one gay or bisexual relationship in this series, I will get mad. Not as much because of LGBTQ plus representation, which is always nice, but for it to be factually correct. Anyway, Eron asks that if that's true, how did they end in that place? And what, what king was she married to? She answers that King Periander, the tyrant of Corinth. So Periander was in fact a real person. He was not a king, but a tyrant. I know that word sounds pretty bad for us, but they were basically the same for Greek people. I have a problem trying to talk about this guy, as it seems to be two different people. In one hand, he removed taxes for the people, and I'm all about paying taxes, but at this time there were no public services, so this money was only for the governor to get rich. Um, he made life for the people at his charge easier in general, and he was accepted as one of the most wise people of his era. On the other hand, it is said that all of this changed radically and he became very bad and killed a lot of innocent people and did horrible things that I don't want to get into, but you can research yourself. So there might be two possible reasons for this. The first one is that he loses his mind, gods know why, and the other one is that these stories are full of shit. I mean, it's just too fucking convenient that he became a monster the moment he started reducing privilege for the aristocracy, who are the ones that wrote history. I, I mean, Aristoteles and Herodoto are not the most reliable sources. And I would give Herodoto a pass because he's funny, but I have personal beef with Aristoteles, so fuck him. I can be as subjective as them if I want. Well, Eron's mother tells him that her marriage was prearranged and she did not have a saying in it. Girl, what are you talking about? Why do you have the concept of free marriage? Literally everybody's marriage was prearranged. Anyhow, she tells us that just as she married, a degenerate god appeared. She doesn't word it like that, but that's what she says. Zeus, with the appearance of an eagle, which is one of his sacred animals, um, watches her bathe. Look, look at that fucking eagle, and tell me it doesn't look like a pervert. And also, girl, what are you doing bathing in the sea? Ancient Greek people had public baths, and you are a queen, so you definitely have a bathtub. I know it would have been weird 
to you know put the eagle spying from a window but but it would be more accurate we see her in a room with the most inaccurate mirror I have ever seen, as mirrors made of glass didn't get invented until 1835. This would have been a hand mirror made of gold, silver, or more commonly, bronze. And look at this reflection out of perspective, I love it. Anyway, Theus adopts the form of the king and rapes these women. I mean, they don't say he does it, but it is implicit. But don't worry, it's good rape, because her husband mistreated her and Zeus gave her flowers pre-rape, so he is the good guy. What do you mean she can consent so this is rape, you crazy blue-haired feminist? And I'm sorry, but this, is, this really infuriates me that they took this myth, which is based on a real one, and decided to still portray rape as not bad. They don't even frame it as rape because he doesn't hit her what the fuck who was the nice guy who wrote this thing B but they we have a feminine warrior so it's super progressive fuck you fuck you creators of the show and i'll say that maybe they address this in a negative light later but 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 we all know they probably won't one day, Zeus gave her a pretty ugly necklace that was shown last episode, but for so little time I'd forgotten about it, hehe, <laughs> sorry. Zeus keeps his raping nice guy thing for months and it's not snowing. Eron's mother is obviously very confused as why her husband acts like two different people, and one day puts a knife to Zeus' throat and asks him who he is. He transforms very dramatically into his real self. Then he pulls some blue roses out of his ass and gives them to her. So remember ladies, if a guy has sex with you without your consent, but he gives you flowers, chill out you crazy bitch. We see a woman with crows, so we know she's bad. She goes to a window and sees the light that Zeus produces when he's got shape coming out of a window. She is obviously searching for Zeus, so we know it's Hera. So Zeus is her own wife. But Hera's sacred animal were not the crows. Her animals are the cow, the peepcock, and the lion, so let me fix a few images for you. Yeah, look at that, far more accurate, that's beautiful. A guy notices Eda watching from the window, and he jumps on a chariot with fire horses, so we know it's Apollo, because we're experts in mythology, of course. <laughs> he touches a mirror and contacts Zeus, telling him that his wife is watching him and that he will cover his place. Eda gets really angry and sad. And as soon as she's going to make some heads roll, Zeus appears behind her, at the same time that Apollo takes his place beside his lover. Hera asks where was he, because she still sees the god light from below, and Zeus says that he was with Poseidon because a giant corpse has reached shore. So this fucking mess is his fault. This has been happening for at least 16 years. He knew that and he thought that cheating on his wife and raping girls was far more important than saving human race. <sighs> Fuck you, Zeus! I fucking hate this series is portraying this guy as one of the good ones. <sighs> Era says that the giants were monsters that gave in to every pleasure and that they should have castrated them. I love how she watches him when he, she's saying this. The series takes us to Apollo and Eron's mother again. She's really confused and she asks him who he is. He says Apollo, but we did know that because as I told you, we are mythology pros. He tells her that Zeus must really love her because he never shows his true form. Well, honey, obviously not, as he usually appears, rapes you and leaves. Such a loving individual. And he only saw himself because she had realized he was not her husband, so he had no options left if he wanted to keep fucking this girl. And he doesn't love her, that's the thing. He doesn't love her, he likes to fuck her. And please let's learn to separate those two concepts, thank you. He also says not to worry that he won't tell Hera because he's a son of Zeus out of wedlock. Honey, honey, Zeus tried to rape your aunt, so she basically killed herself, transforming herself into an island, and then Zeus raped your mom and forced everyone to reject her so she could only give birth in the island that used to be her sister, and when she was nine days overdue on her pregnancy, her daughter was born so she could help her birth you. Shut up that pretty face! <sighs> Apollo also tells her that she's pregnant with a child of Zeus. Time passes and Eron's mother says that the eye of a jealous woman is a sharp one. 
I'm going to keep this brief because you must be tired of me whining, but it angers me so much that you being angry because your husband cheats on you is bad, but raping and cheating is good. Nice message. Uh, and this image should be like this. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we see her pregnant and praying to Zeus in this beautifully funny image, which has won the title of best photogram of this episode, and the crowd flies to the Mount Olympus. It transforms into a pretty angry and sad era. She enters a beautifully designed room. I'm sorry for the low quality version I can't show you, because these designs are fantastic. Well, the three Onidos appear one by one, and Hera convinces them to give King Periandro dreams in which his wife gives birth to twins, and one of them is not his, so, so basically the truth. He swears to his wife that if she gives birth to another man's baby, he will kill him. We go back to the scene from the beginning, the one in which an eagle saves the little baby heron. One soldier throws a spear at the bird, and in half a second he transforms himself and makes the soldier explode. So he can transform quickly, and when he takes a while, like last time, is only to show off. Okay. The king, who in words of the beautiful strange Aeons is a big boy galaxy brain, sees that Theus has blue eyes like the bastard, and he orders his soldiers to attack. What? Are you stupid? He's a god, pray for mercy. His soldiers, who are as stupid as he is, attack the immortal god that they have before their eyes, even though he just killed one of them using only his mind. This brings me the question, if Theus didn't have blue eyes, if, if he had brown eyes, they could not have figured out that he was a bastard, didn't they? Hm. That's pretty convenient. So, while Theus is fighting the soldiers, the, I don't know how human soldiers can fight with him, but anyway, Periandro takes Eron and he's going to throw him from the balcony, but his wife pulls him and stabs him in the eye with a dagger, so that's pretty cool. The king falls off the balcony and he dies. But if he died, why did Eron know who he was? Because he knew his name and his title, and this boy has no money, so he, he can go to school. Weird. Theus go next to Heron's mother, and he teleports them and his baby out of there, abandoning the other one, despite she is begging him not to. He takes them to the polis uh, we all know and love, and he plays the cloud to cover them from Eros' case. Okay, so the people there are right. If they were not there, there would be no clouds. And also, if I was Eda and I saw a cloud in the same place for more than a decade, I would get sus as fuck and I would go check that thing out, especially knowing that my rapist cheater husband controls his skies. Eron asks about his twin and the mother tells him that he was killed by his uncle. She opens her necklace and we see two rocks. I guess one is Eron and the other one is his brother because blue and brown eyes, I don't know. The mother tells him not to look for revenge and that he is the son of Zeus. Eron is pretty pissed, as I would be. I'm, I'm really loving this character. I, I usually hate protagonists, so please, Eron, please, Eron, keep being normal. And he tells her that Zeus has done nothing from them, unlike the old man. I know the writers are putting this dialogue, so we see how good Zeus is, but fuck you, he's a piece of shit. Eron also states that Theus is a coward for abandoning her, for forcing her to live in a place where everybody hates her, and I'm going to add to the list that he's also a coward for raping her, almost making her mad, and being a cheater and a liar, who is afraid of his wife but not sorry for his actions. As he speaks, he realizes that the old dude is Theus. I mean, props to him, because I would not have guessed that in his place. He looks at the forge and has a really unnecessary flashback of the beginning of the episode. He takes the amphor with the Oniros and he starts smashing the forge with it. Even though it is made of clay, it doesn't break. He realizes a beautiful blue sword lying next to the forge. He takes it and it starts glowing. Full of anger, he throws the sword far away and it lands in a rock and produces very dramatic lightnings. We cut back to Alexia. She's looking at the map from last episode. She's sitting near a tree with lemons, so with a swing of her sword, she cuts one and she spreads the juice in the map, revealing a secret map inside the map. <laughs> okay, there are a few things wrong with this. First, lemon trees were not common in Europe until the Muslims started to plant them here, and lemons were a luxury item because of this in ancient Greece and Rome, so I don't think she would be sitting next to a lemon tree. Um, 
Also, ancient Greek people did not have invisible ink. They had other ways of passing secret letters, like writing a message in wood, covering it with wax, and then writing a false message on top of that of that wax. But invisible ink, no. And lastly, how did Alexia reach that limon with a swing of her sword? Does she have the one blow a hundred fell? A soldier asks her if she can read the map, and she says no, but that her teacher in Chiron can. So she's definitely a demigod or something similar, as Kiron is the master of heroes. I'll make a video about him someday, he's a sweetheart. Anyway, some guys start surrounding in the camp. N not suspicious at all, just like 20 people in the middle of the forest at night. N not demons, just people. The soldier gets into defensive position and the people start transforming into demons. I don't know why they didn't come as demons in the first place, but anyway. And Alexia recognizes one as the guy from the last episode. I envy her because I have terrible face recognition skills. We also see a hippogriff in the distance and off top of him the, the demon king. Yeah, that's his name from now on. So the demon king murders one soldier from really far away and the battle begins. Zeus and Eron's mom, whom I'm just going to call Ama until they tell me her name. Ama is mother in classic Greek and in Euskera too. Nice. So Zeus and Ama have a discussion and she tells him that he fears Hera more than she loves her. Yes, obviously he's a coward and he has very bad communication skills. Some crows are watching this scene and they fly away to tell Hera. I don't know how they took so long to find them. We go back to the battle, it's finished and obviously the soldiers have lost and we see them systematically killed after refusing to become demons. They look for Alexia's corpse but only find her helmet because she is a deserter who has abandoned her soldiers and most importantly, her shield. Shame on her. The demons take Cerberus and he's a tiny little cute three-headed Doberman, which is pretty accurate, I think. I always pictured Cerberus as a giant beast, but in Greek drawings he seems just like a little bigger than your average dog. And I always imagined him as a Rottweiler, but none of these dogs existed during that time, so obviously they, they had their own breeds. Zeus presents himself in his own man disguise before Eron and reveals in the most dramatic transformation yet that he is in fact Zeus. Eron basically tells his father after a brief discussion that he does not want to see him again, after Zeus asks for his forgiveness. I, lo I love Eron, I love Eron! He leaves and Alexia appears running and she and Eron watch Cerberus getting close to them. And the episode finished there. <sighs> That was a long one, sorry, I know I sometimes run too much. Anyways, thank you for watching, and I want to thank you all for your following. My beautiful basilisks have tripled themselves in the last week, so thank you all for the support. And wish me luck big for, because I have exams in a few weeks, so I might be more inactive. And also, i like to do a shout out to Drama TM. He's a beautiful creator slash person and he has great videos, so go check her out. We will do a collab as soon as we finish our respective exams. So have a nice Iron Age. Bye!